SmackDown last night, right? <laughs> it's like why I tuned in. I'm just it's why I actually participated. It's actually down. why I was like awake, spoiling things for everyone. Y'all ready? Gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Raj Nation Innovations Discover Your Inner Awesome Podcast. My name is Rajiv Nathan, aka the Raj Nation. I am your show's host, the founder of Raj Nation Innovation, as well as a hip hop artist and a yoga instructor. Above all else, I am a storyteller. And I am joined by my co host, Victoria Cohen. Victoria is the voice behind the blog almondsandasana.com. She is a fellow yogi and a community activist focused on helping you make lifestyle choices that positively impact you and the people you serve. This is Discover Your Inner Awesome, the only show where you get to eavesdrop on conversations with entrepreneurs, artists, and musicians about the stories, the journeys, the struggles, but most importantly, the questions. The questions that help creative thinkers like you and I better understand who we are, what we're doing, and how we can do it better. Is real talk with real people doing real big things to uncover the real side of success. Now, before we dive into today's conversation, I would like to extend an invitation if you are not a member already. Join our tribe by going to discoveryourinnerawesome.com. Enter your email address there, and you will never miss another episode of the show, getting a notification in your inbox every single Monday when we launch a new episode. You'll also get my stories, advice, and tips throughout the month on how you as a startup can make your pitch a performance. All right, let's dive in now to our conversation on today's episode of Discover Your Inner Awesome. Welcome to the Discover Your Inner Awesome podcast. Today on the show, we have Greg Rothstein. Greg is a photographer in the Chicago area. He's actually the official photographer for 1871, one of the largest tech hubs in the entire world, actually, one of the largest tech entrepreneurship hubs in the entire world. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Excited, you know. So, Greg, our conversation or our topic today is when do you get your shit together? Now, we talked a few weeks ago, and this is what you said, like, has been really on your mind. So, let us know, why is this on your mind and why is this important to you? I mean, I took a, a different path than the typical uh, person does, I guess, with, with college. I studied art, I studied photography, and I actually was very fortunate enough to be able to work my way into having a full-time career with photography. But along the way, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't prepared and I'm still you know, learning to, how to catch up with learning things like invoicing, cold calling, business development skills, marketing skills, developing a, a brand and a voice for my social media. So it's, you know, I'll, I've got friends who are, you know, they go to their day job and they're nine to five, but I have to work all these different facets. And, you know, I, I want to focus mainly on photography because that's what interests me. I've got, you know, a short attention span, the ADHD, just like everyone else does. But um, it's really hard for me to get all of the, the business parts in place. And so I think getting your, you know, getting your stuff together is just vitally important because if you don't have that, it's going to crumble. And especially I scale, I'd like to think that I scale a little too fast, which is really cool because it's like awesome. I've had some great experiences, but at the same time, I was not devoting that same amount of time to the business side and making sure that, you know, again, all my ducks are in order. So you've got the photography business going well today. Mm -hmm. Let's take it back to day one ish. <laughs> <laughs> There's wrestling reference. Ref number. By the wrestling way, reference listening. number one. Two everybody listening. Can we get a two seat every everybody single time? Be I have literally no idea what you're talking. <laughs> about. I'm so. just. I just want to go on the record that he was the one to bring up a wrestling reference first, and that I did survive. It was kind of a test <laughs> at the end of the day to see who would do it first. <laughs> And for everyone listening, Greg and I met because one day I was sitting at 1871, the incubator I just alluded to, where Greg's a photographer, and Greg literally just walked up to, I was working on my laptop, and Greg just walked up to me and goes, he like puts his hands on the table, he's like, hey, I'm pretty sure there's a photo of you dressed like Razor Ramon on Facebook. Is that you? And I was like, probably. What, you, what he's trying to say is I creeped on Raj's Facebook and saw that he was dressed as Razor Ramon for something, and he's holding a WWE title belt, and I'm like, oh, this guy's cool. So I started seeing him around 1870. I was like, well, 
you know, let's just see if he's like a big fan. And so now he's part of, you know, the wrestling wolf pack. Yes. Now oh, that was a good one. That's yeah. also a very subtle reference, both Hangover and uh, NWO. Oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> yeah. it's, set, it's setting off here. So, oh, yeah, God. so Greg and I have known each other now for probably almost a year. Yeah. And we talk all the time about wrestling. But today we're talking about photography stuff and yeah. the world of things. So if we dial it back to the day one-ish area of things, um, let's take it back to sort of your education okay. and going into college – Where'd you grow up first off? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I grew up in Deerfield, Illinois, about 30 minutes north of uh, Chicago in the suburbs. My parents now live in Tucson, Arizona, but um, I did not have an interest in photography growing up. Uh, my dad and grandpa both love it as a as a hobby. And, you know, I, I would take photos, but by no means owned a camera or a set of gear or anything. Uh, when I went to college initially, I started at the University of Iowa, went in as a psych major, transferred to DePaul, stayed as a psych major, went to a screenwriting major, and I was writing movie scripts, and that's, I think, where I love wrestling because I love the writing side. But I took a digital still photography for non-majors. Professor was Todd Mate, and I remember I was like, this is really, this is like kind of fun, and some of the assignments were cool. Like, I was doing street photography and all that, and mind you, this was before... God, this sounds so weird saying, but but this was really before Instagram was a major thing. So photography wasn't as, at the time, you know, it was not everyone was a photographer at that point. We still, you know, the iPhone was still developing and all of that. So I then took thinking photography, I think this next following, the following fall quarter with Steve Harp. And Steve Harp um, is the, you know, I'll consider the godfather of photography for for my career who's helped grow it and helped facilitate as much as he could to make sure I was getting a, uh, a good education. So I took thinking photography and I was like, can I major in this? And he's like, yeah, we have an art school. Mm -hmm. And so I <laughs> became a photography major and I, um, you know, during my education, I was freelancing mainly doing small stuff. Um, it started with sororities. Delta Gamma DePaul was one of the first sororities to work with me consistently. And I, I always shout them out because they, they have literally been there with me from the beginning. And I'm now you know, four years out of college and they still have hired me three times a year. I get an email. Mm -hmm. Hey, are you free for our semi-formal, our bid day, our formal? And it's just, you know, they still, I, you know, I honor the same rates that I used to give. And it's just, it's been nice to have that passed down. But I got into photography for access. I, um, I was not invited to a lot of uh, events and sorority functions and all of that. And so well, why not get paid to go there and have <laughs> a good time? Why not do that? And I found that when I got access to those things, I was like, well, where else can the camera get me access to? I delved into concert photography very briefly, um, doing a mixture of mostly portfolio building work. Um, I didn't make a lot of money in that world. It's very hard and cutthroat because for every photographer who wants to make it, there is three photographers, five photographers who will do it for free. And so it's hard to really take off unless you really wiggle your way in and network in and then you're, you're set. Um, on the flip side, when I was making money, I was, you know, I was very happy with the work I was producing, but I realized, you know, there were other photography groups that were better than me. And I knew that while I loved music photography, I was not the best. There's a group called Alive Coverage, and there's like three photographers, two photographers in there, well, three, uh, that I really admire. And they're Doug Van Sant, Julian, C or not Julian Cassidy, well, I admire Julian Cassidy. Uh, Jake Lifshitz and um, Christopher Lazaro, they are masterful artists of music photography and I just realized that I, I when I started seeing that type of caliber of work I knew my work could get there but I knew that they you know it was something that I would have to put in so much time and networking into that I just I think there was more opportunity in the corporate world and so I got connected to the Chicago startup scene when I was working for a company called Cloud Spotter. I initially was working for uh, for them and we were collaborating on the photography at 1871 when I decided to move on and uh, kind of pursue more independent work myself, I uh, returned to a, a little bit bigger of a capacity with 1871 directly handling their photography. And from there, I uh, brought on a couple more partners uh, into my you know, portfolio of companies that I work with. And when I say that, these are companies that I have contracted, you know, an executed contract for for a year. I do their everything from headshots, events, um, marketing. <laughs> Um, and so that's been really incredible to see over the last few years. I've even started traveling, um, and that's been the most fulfilling part of my career, uh, recently traveling for a new client via uh, a, another Chicago startup called Tag Prince. Uh, they I do, know that. cool. yeah, so they're, uh, one of their founders is a buddy from college, and we were not, Andy, right? Andy, yeah, Andy Marsh. So uh, 
we were not buddies per se in college, acquaintances, but we have become very good partners. And when he needed a photographer for something, he gave me a ring and work this very small event, maybe no bigger than the room over there, which the, they can't see, but it was a very small event, 20 people, and uh, the client was very excited and we've started working with them more. And so should see some more traveling with them. And it's, uh, I've just been slowly building, you know, a network of photographers that I can staff at events to so that when I'm double and triple booked, I'm able to deliver high quality professional photographers that are act with the same professionalism that I do. And, you know, can make sure that my clients are taken care of. And so, you know, I got this nice little network growing. And so, I don't know, it's, it's cool. Well, it's nice too that you've built out like the photography network as oh, yeah. well. I want to, I want to actually bring it back to the college portion of yeah, this. Yeah, totally. You said that you kind of got into this because you wanted, you, you weren't getting access per se. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I was a weird, I'm a, I'm very different. <laughs> God, this is so bad. This is gonna be vulnerable as heck. Um, when I was in college, I was, you know, I was social and all that, but I still had my, you know, I still like being alone and, and all of that, but always wanted to be, you know, out with the, out with, out with friends and all that. But it, the, the bar scene was never my thing. It's not, that's just not who I am. And so access was important. I liked being able to see, how, again, I, I think I said it a second ago where it's like, it was cool to see where the camera got me when I was like 21 and stuff, but five years now after that, it's just insane to see where it had. And so I just kind of had, it's an addiction about access and just seeing how many cool opportunities I can rack up and see like all these little, you know, it's like a hunting, it's kind of like a hunting wall where I see all these photos and it's, oh, I remember all these different incidents and all these different moments. And it's, you know, it's just kind of cool to see where it can take me. Um, and that's when, I mean, that's what it, that's what it was, that's what it was really, really about. So, I'm at the beginning you said that you feel like you scaled, you scaled really quickly. Um, so how, like, what is that? Uh, and then you kind of mentioned that you've like brought on partners and, and, and these different things that you've done, but what does that look like? I mean, I'm not a photographer. Yeah. I like, I so don't know like that world. Like when you say you scaled really quickly, how fast were you adding things on? Like, what was your day like? What were you, you know, were you running from place to place? Like kind of like, what's, what's, what's that like? What's a day in the so life? So initially it started, 1871 was the epicenter of my photography career. They have been such a good strategic partner for me that they've, they've really gone above and beyond. And so they do a thousand events a year. So that, that's just baseline. Let's start there. A thousand events a year. A thousand? A thousand. So, like so a few a day. So a few a day. We're looking at a few a day, and that could be yeah. anything from three to five to seven. I joke around with our our CEO Howard, where there was a day I remember we did. He did the same, you know, set of uh, he. We were going to a bunch of different spaces, and he, you know, had same he page. gave same. We were just we had to kind of give the same boilerplate stuff, and it's you know we've got, um, but that's just only a, you know a fraction of the stuff we do. We have events with you know with the city of Chicago, with the YWCA, everyone, and so. I'm always running around there. Mm -hmm. And when I kind of was able to manage that schedule and kind of realize, okay, I've got a good rhythm for it. I know what's going on. I knew that it was time to see like, all right, what extra work can I take on as a, as a, you know, in the freelance world. And so I found myself doing more portraits and all that along the way, demand kind of started to slowly grow and, and demand is, I don't, I don't want to blow my ego or <laughs> blow my, who I am. Like, it's just, when I say demand, it's just a couple times when there happened to be double bookings, triple bookings, um, from just photographers I've met along the way, I was like, hey, can you can you do this for me? And mm -hmm. I'm very specific about how I want my photography done mm -hmm. and how I want them interacting with my clients because it's a, it's a make or break industry that if you don't provide the, you know, the customer service aspect, you're not going to survive. You can take the best photos in the world, but if you can't deliver good customer service and be personable and schmoozing with the clients and all of that, I, I just don't see that being, it, it won't work out. And so I'm not afraid to, if it's not a fit for, for my team, then it, mm -hmm. it's not a fit. So I've got four photographers who I, you know, Rena, uh, Andrew, Noah, Karina, and then my, my current intern, Alexandria, who are all incredible photographers in their own respect, but they've, you know, worked with me closely at 1871 to understand what the rhythm is there. So they, you know, they get the same tone. They know the expectations. And then I'll bring them, sometimes I'll bring them to an event with me if it's with another client so that they can um, exceed that. But most of them, it's it's just use your brain and use common sense. And they over communicate with me because I, I like to know, hey, where are you guys at? Are you guys on site? Are you early? And so I was building all that and I've been able to pay them too. Like that's been real to write a check for, there was an event that I cut one of my photographers to write a check for a thousand dollars to a photographer. And I, st and I still made money from that. That was special for me because photography, it's, 
it's hard. It is a hard industry if you don't have a good rhythm of work and good consistency. Good consistency. And um, while all of that was going on, I was not really paying attention to the aspect of, hey, are you making sure that you are uh, doing taking out quarterly taxes? And I always do that, and it's always I've always hit every deadline as it should. But it's just it's though you got to focus on the business stuff. It's not fun. Like no one wants to do taxes. No one wants to pay quarterly taxes. No one wants to do that stuff at times, especially an artist such such as myself who's just very, you know, creative based. Um, so I kind of let all that kind of fall to the side and didn't take it as seriously. And now with 2018 starting, I realize, you know, I've got kind of a fresh time to start. We're a couple months into the year where I can get everything organized. I can get the, you know, I can have somebody teach me to use QuickBooks. And once you have everything kind of in there and all of that, from what I understand, it's kind of, it falls together. Um, but that was, that was the biggest thing was just making sure that I'm tracking expenses and all that. Cause you know, it adds yeah. up for tax season. And, and you mentioned right before we started the show, and then you mentioned a little bit about like your education at um, DePaul, but so I want to, I want to go back to that because I have like some thoughts on this too. And I think it's kind of interesting. Like you said that you felt like you left college and you were prepared in a certain way, but that like now as your business in photography has progressed, you don't feel like you got the preparation that you needed to manage it from like a business perspective. Let's see. We're what's I, I don't want to I want to dance around the subject matter delicately because I loved my time at DePaul. I I really Steve Harp, Matt Gerson, Zach Ostrowski, Adam Schreiber. Um, I'm sure there are Annie Heckman, uh, Joanna Gardner, Huggett. I had Annie Heckman. Annie Heckman was awesome. <laughs> oh man, those professors. Oh yeah, so we both went to DePaul. Oh yes, we both went <laughs> to DePaul. That's Great. Worth but I didn't uh, know you in college because I don't even know. It's if, okay. I was I, I wasn't the type. You might have been a freshman when I was a senior. Yeah, I was a weird kid too. And I spit in the face of freshmen. Right, right. <laughs> um. Those professors really helped foster a great learning environment for me, and they knew that I wanted to do this as a business. I think it was clear that I had the entrepreneur, as I touched the table again, um, <laughs> I think it was very clear that I had the entrepreneurial kind of bug in me, and they did it, everything that they could to kind of facilitate that. Steve, in particular, um, I was his undergrad assistant. I did a couple independent studies with him that allowed me to kind of get credit, class credit for stuff that interests me, such as portraiture, because um, it, it, I didn't learn those things. I didn't know I wanted to be a photographer, and I don't know what other art schools education programs look like. I don't know if you know an SAIC or Columbia is teaching you how to you know direct your models and all of that. But I, I appreciated learning film photography from DePaul. But I'm sorry, that's 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 not valuable for me. I I, I didn't pref I didn't really prefer to take beginning drawing because I'm not a an artist. I don't identify as a you know a physical artist and. I, uh, I was resentful for that once I came into my career because it's like, well, why did I waste that time? Like, what? Drawing like, stick with figures. due respect, with due respect to the curriculum and and all that, I understand getting exposure to different artistic mediums. If that's their goal, great, cool, I appreciate it. But that doesn't help me my education. Um, additionally, the biggest thing, and this is this was my real gripe, is I learned no business skills at DePaul. Like, I haven't used a resume or CV ever in my career. Like. The, those were two vital things, and I know other people use them. Mm -hmm. I know those are really relevant yeah. things for for artists but and business professionals. For, but yeah. for an entrepreneur who's building his own business, I don't, you know, I don't need my resume. I need my one shot, and I need to do it good, and that's going to open the doors for that. But I, um, I really res was was frustrated with having to learn a CV because those are more artistic based. That's that's if you're you know, showcasing your work, and I, I just don't see my myself touching that 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 line of work or that world. I certainly produce my my images for art to me, but it's not like fine art. And I just, I think they put too much of an emphasis on fine art. I appreciate and I admire a lot of the photographers that I got to go to school with, but I just wish I had had more knowledge on just crafting emails, cold emailing, like cold calling and maintaining a business relationship and I don't, just like the, the stuff that allows you to be a strong entrepreneur and, and, and business person. Cause there's anyone studying art is probably not going to be in kind of a, a, a full-time role. It'll be a contract, an independent contractor, a freelancer role. Like we need to learn those things to manage ourselves and manage our businesses, not sit in a beginning drawing class where there are people who clearly have a drawing advantage and people like me who I couldn't hold a pencil right for, for heck's sake. And it's just, you know, I really, I was frustrated with that. I, I did love learning the history of art and I think it gave me an appreciation for what is art today. Um, 
because contemporary art is anything can be art. I mean, Marcel Duchamp did it when with his you know with the Dada art movement. But um, I just wasn't prepared, and I, I was especially when I think it was when I turned twenty five or twenty like twenty six. I was really angry at, at college. I was like, why why did I do this? Because I could have put all of the money that went towards tuition and all that that could have gone towards building an like a photography studio an empire and all that and granted i needed certain classes and certain experiences to have gotten to where i am now but um i think it could have just been done in a different way and i think that's why i've loved the team aspect of my photography team because i get to teach them and, and work with them because these are photographers who mostly are to i think all of them except for Rena, are uh, all DePaul based. And so some of them photo minors, some of them photo majors, but all of them in a certain photo capacity. And so getting to work with them and teach them those things is, I think is, it's really fulfilling for me. And it's why, you know, I, I do consider a role of, in going to education years and years down the road. <laughs> Victoria, I think you had like a soapbox moment within this idea of yeah, the college no, experiment, yeah, experience. Yeah, it's interesting. And I even sometimes like, I actually felt this way in college about high school because I felt like, and, and I think it's tricky because technology changes so quickly. You were even saying before you were like, when I was in college and same with us, we're a little bit older, like Instagram wasn't really like a platform. I mean, I didn't get Instagram until like what, after I graduated college. So like that wasn't, I mean, how could they have possibly taught you how to navigate your social media really <laughs> yeah, when like it true. didn't exist when it didn't exist so I fully understand that like education is oh yeah no that to, totally just daggered my, to my the, argument there <laughs> no 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 no, but but it's but, like true it's like they didn't who would have thought that Instagram would have now become the place so important would have like, become the new, the new portfolio the new storefront the exactly. new brick and mortar like I don't think anyone expected it to, right. to go to that level right so I do think that like that that's one one thing I'll give to like education is that it's I mean it it takes a long time for a curriculum to be built or for majors or degrees to be built. So taking that into account that edu that um, that uh, technology changes so quickly in platforms, et cetera. However, um, like to your point of that, you just didn't feel like you ever learned how to like just create an invoice or to how do I plan to save my taxes every quarter, you know, or how, you know, how do I even like think about those sort of things? And I, so, so for me, I actually felt that more like in college, when I got to college, I felt like there was this assumption that everyone just knew how to use Excel and knew how to use PowerPoint and all this stuff. And like, I mean, I did, but I never felt like I had a great foundation of that in high school. And that did exist then. So like that, they totally <laughs> could have taught us. Instead, it was like, I was forced to take like a dance class and you know, like, no, seriously. And like, oh, that, which was fine. But like, I, I think it probably would have been more valuable like, if yeah, I learned four or five Excel. grand spent on that dance class. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, just things like that where, where uh, kind of like your drawing class, mm -hmm. like, okay, uh, I exercise on my own. <laughs> I tried to fight so hard to get out of that class. Like I went to my, I think I went, Steve was my, Steve Harp was my academic advisor. And I was like, do I really have to take this? Because I knew there were going to be students in there who did this, like who just did it as a hobby. And I didn't want to go through a class where I was going to be the bottom of the barrel. Like I'm a I, I know I could, at the time I remember saying to him, I was like, I could shoot circles around these kids, <laughs> but I couldn't draw a circle if I tried, like, I couldn't <laughs> draw a circle if I tried properly. And it's like, I just, I didn't, it wasn't valuable. Like I'm out of college. I will tell you right now, beginning drawing did not help any part of my education. So if there's anyone from DePaul who does hear this, it didn't help. Like <laughs> Don't give, take like, beginning drawing. Like, give me something, give me a, prof like the professional practice class, yeah. gear it towards business. That yeah. was, that, that would be the biggest, biggest advice I would give is, is just, or give, even, give some sort of business intro or entrepreneur, like put an entrepreneurship court track mm -hmm. in there or something. I don't know. We, so actually, and I will give props to SMU where I went, Southern Methodist. Um, so I studied engineering, but they had a big push in the engineering school for kids to take classes in the business school. We had to take one accounting class. We had to take one marketing class. We had to take one management oh, class. That's awesome. We had to take engineering communication. We had to take technical entrepreneurship. So they actually did that's a impressive. Bit, yeah, super impressive. That's so really seriously, awesome. Shout out SMU in 2000, from 2007 to 2011, they already had that in place. I think that's awesome. probably could have been even better, but like props to them for, for doing all of that. And like within engineering communications, it was, it was exactly those things you talked about, like how to craft an email talking about technical things in terms that like a business person could understand, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that sort of thing, um, doing presentations, et cetera. But I think that's so, so, so valuable because 
honestly one of the first thing one of the first like jobs that I had in Pepsi which is where I went after okay. college was I literally I was on this like super technical statistical modeling team and my job for 6 months was basically to be the liaison between these stat guys <laughs> they were only guys so like say that just these guys statistical modelers and then the business people that needed to use that information but like the two didn't speak very they didn't speak the same language so my job was literally to like be the go between and help explain that and i do feel like i i had um i had some of the tools to do that but if i didn't that that would be really hard and i'd be super frustrated that like that wasn't taught to me when that was like the most important thing I was doing. And I mean, I don't want to take away that DePaul didn't prepare me, but I, I definitely do want to shout out a couple of people who did prepare me. I, my first my first opportunity when I started with 18.7 with, uh, I think I mentioned Cloudspire, um, CEO Ryan Jacobs, CEO Mike Dawson at the time, they both were so patient with me. They took a lot of time and invested a lot of patience in me to kind of help build kind of get rev up the engine to get there so it's definitely i think it, it should also go without saying that finding somebody who can help you with that in the beginning is like essential like having a mentor or somebody in that capacity whether it's a teammate um that was that was i found that to be very helpful along the way um that you know having somebody who's like who will review your emails and basically kind of get you up there till you're off the runway and then you're smooth sailing and all that so i'll say this and then i want to kind of transition into a, a new part of this topic but I understand what you're saying on that college front. Like, I actually think anyone in an arts program should have to take a couple business classes yeah. because there's a high likelihood you're going to have some type of entrepreneurial endeavor. Mm -hmm. I will say at the same time, though, you don't know if beginning drawing had a different effect on someone else. Fair. And Fair. Like, for me, I was a graphic design minor in college because... I had these electives I could take and I chose animation and I was like, that was really fun. And I really like the Photoshop aspect yeah. of this. And then I was like, oh, why don't I do this as a minor? Oh, totally. And I think it could help me with marketing because I can then speak design to designers. And that, that literally was the purpose I had for it. And that's the purpose that mm -hmm. it has served me in my life. Right. But had I not had that option to pick animation, yeah. where someone else in that class would be like, this is stupid. Oh, totally. I'm a whatever major. This is pointless. While I was you know, trying to figure out if the sun should be pushing the shadow this way or that way, <laughs> yeah. there's somebody who's like, oh my god, this is, I'm going to become a comic book writer. I'm going to become the next, you know, Andy Warhol was probably yeah. the next Andy Warhol. Now, in my, the design minor, I wish I didn't have to take the intro to art class where <laughs> I had to create a color wheel, which I got a C on. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm not too good with uh, Annie Heckman can probably that tell was you. Her class. Annie Heckman's class. And I just want to, I took that with Danny Zimmerman. I want to be, I want to be, if, I'm going to show Danny this because that class, we were, so it was mostly, we were just kind of the two frat boys because I was in a frat and all that. And we, the work we put out compared to other ones, you'd see these beautiful collages and all of these great stuff. And then there's Danny did a lion. It's like a big lion face, about as big of like a like a wall, mural size. But he, did, he printed like gal printed galaxies, and so he called it Space Lion. And like he was so proud of it. But it's like all these art, nice artwork juxtaposed with like that was the type of stuff we put out. <laughs> nice. Like that was a great class. All right, art. so. We get into this idea of needing to get your shit together because you feel like you're not adequately prepared. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I want to clarify though is, you know, you wish you would have taken some of these like how to network classes, things like that, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you said the people who you bring onto your team, they have to know how to schmooze clients, yeah. not schmooze, how to, how to like interact, how to interact. And yeah. So where did those skills come from? Especially because you said you were more or less like kind of awkward in college. Yeah. But you also just said you were a frat boy. So now I'm like really confused because at first yeah, you were like, no, oh, I, I lived, I lived in a bunch I think of, you meant that like idea. I was like, like oh. the frat boy. Lifestyle. I was like the frat boy, but like the artsy emo kid. Like I lived in both of those, mm -hmm. those worlds. So where did I learn that from? I've always been good at talking and you know, with client relations. I come from a background in retail when I started, you know, working, I worked for Abercrombie. Wow. I wouldn't expect that. No. Yeah, right. Were you the guy with I don't the know. Shirt? I don't know how I. I that's done. the thing. I don't know how I slipped through there. Like clearly, <laughs> clearly their admissions process was was something was wrong with it because it's like good looking, good looking. Hey, how did you sneak in there at five foot two and less than hundred rounds? Um, and while I make fun of my my retail past, I certainly learned um, customer service there, the foundation of it, and just making sure that like you can't you got to keep your cool at all times if there you know you see in you know on youtube and all the funny videos get shared of like viral blow-ups and stuff but like that's 
that's not how you can act in in the real world, you know, if you want to advance or if you want to continue your career because those are the things that will prevent you from getting a career. But so it started with them. And then I always shout out, let us entertain you. Um, I, they truly allowed me to talk. I did hosting for them right out of college. They were my first job out of college. I did hosting, carry out, serving. I worked all of those different worlds and that I think somehow translated into like an effective management skill. Um, working carry out, it would be either working the line or making sure that all the orders are coming through and all that. And I think the speed and all of that, I'm just good at managing various tasks and then obviously interacting with clients all at the same time. So photography, when I go shoot a gig, it's kind of all of that. I'll schmooze with the clients, but then I'll be in my own world kind of focused, taking, you know, potpourri shots of the food or, or networking shots where I don't need to interact. And so mm-hmm. with Let Us Entertain You, I kind of got to live in all those worlds. And so I think it taught me how to, you know, talk to a client and just treat them, make them feel like they are the most important person that are, that are there. And that's, that's what it is, is every, every gig that I shoot, they are the, that client in those, for those three hours, those two hours, they are the most important person that I'm putting my time into. And it's the same, it's, it's just like serving. You have a duration and then it's, you, it, then it ends and then everyone goes home. And you know, if you're lucky, you get to see those customers again and you serve them again. Same way where they come back if they need more photography. And you just conceive seeing more and more consistency. And so I, I think I learned it all slowly, like look at hindsight. I learned it definitely from the foundation that Let Us Entertain You and Abercrombie, you know, gave me and taught me. Let Us, I think, takes a really nice approach where it's like, hey, if you can do this, this amount, we can teach you the rest. And um, I think that's a very good approach to live by because you can really make some great, great teammates out of that, that approach. Okay, so you've got the, you know, you're at the point, you've got your team. You're realizing invoicing, all this stuff, taxes, et cetera, within this sort of confusion, more or less. In what ways do you feel it's like holding you back that you don't have this acumen already? Um, stress. I can feel that it's something that's on my mind and it's something that's always pressing. And when when it's there and it's there daily, you it kind of eats at you and you're just like, well, Am I doing something wrong? Is are, are, is everything not in order as it should? And so I think it's just better ahead of time as I'm learning to get this all together. Specifically, the, the biggest thing that's like kind of stressing me out with my, my business is just making sure that I'm recording everything properly financially or even putting it into a uh, like a Salesforce-like service where it's like, all right, this person is inquired. This has a proposal out, all that. Getting all of that, if I didn't have that stress that I was thinking about that I have right now that I'm feeling <laughs> to talk about it, um, it would allow me to put my energy towards a lot of other creative mm-hmm. endeavors that are the stuff that I do want to care about. Because once this thing is in order, once, or at least I hope, knock on wood, once these things are in order, I can you know put that energy towards continuing the fun stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's just a part of, you know, Planting your foot in the ground, and if this is what I, if this is you know going to make an LLC out of it, make a business out of it, you got to do it. You got to you got to take it seriously, and it can't just be a you know invoice here, invoice there. You got to put it in like make it legit. And plus legitimacy, it's you know I think it's like there's an exciting aspect of like coming off super legitimate to my clients where it's you know I'm sending them a, a pre cooked email where it's like all it's got all the copy there, it's got the invoice, it's got the amount. Like there's something. I guess validating. Exciting. There's something validating, exciting. So, but I'm you're not, running a business at that point. Yes. You're not making money off a hobby. Exactly. You're and not I, just I, making I, it up. As and you I know. know I'm a professional. I've been doing this full time for basically since out of college. I've been really lucky to do that. But I, I really want to take that next step. And I, I would, I would really stress to, to photographers, entrepreneurs, business people out there that take the step early so that you don't have to do it when you're 26 and already have it because it's a, it's stressful and mm-hmm. you should be putting your time towards other things, but. You know, if it takes a couple months to get that together, so be it. I think so that, that kind of creates this idea of having a system or sy- systems in place mm-hmm. early on. So you're not yeah. playing catch up exactly. later on. Um, specifically in your field or any artistic creative field, there are a lot of people who only know the art side of it. They don't ever think about the business side mm-hmm. of it. Um, I mean, like even Victoria with what you're doing with the blog and the Instagram influencing that kind of stuff, right? So when you look at that, how do you, like, what's the lens you're looking at through right now? Is it the blog that is getting ideas out there? Or is it the business, figure out how to run this like a business? 
No, more the more the former. But I'm feeling stressed about the second piece of it as well because as things come along, where someone's like, "Hey, can you look?" I recently did this like really great event where it was like an influencer event that I also taught a yoga class at, and like you know figuring out navigating that and you know how much and all the sort of stipulations around it and invoicing and all of that. Um, Yeah, definitely feeling like a lot of what I'm doing. I mean, I have rates and, and all that, but like that things are one off you know, and that it changes a little bit here and there. Well, you got to, because, you know, with rates and all that, you got to sprinkle. Totally, They've always totally. got to be flexible. Flexible, make sure absolutely. That everyone's ta- yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. But even just feeling like I have everything in one place and like a standard format, um, even just processes, like I'm really trying to figure out like a lot of kind of how I've like pushed my blog content out there so far has been like, as I create content that just like comes to me, like, so a lot of my blog is cooking. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, as I decide, as I like pick a recipe and make something, that's just the next thing that's out. And then sometimes I'm like, hmm, maybe there should be more of a rhyme or reason as to like why I did this thing. And then I gave them that recipe and that like, maybe there should be a little bit more of a strategy behind it. Or like, maybe there are certain days of the week that it makes more sense to talk about food recipes versus yoga versus like personal stuff. Right. Maybe it's more valuable to give someone a recipe on a Sunday than a Wednesday. Um, and I haven't like, that's more to me, the kind of like organization and strategy mm-hmm. that I haven't put in enough time thinking about it. it's mostly been just like content get it out the door yeah. get something out there does it look good on my Instagram you get so, does it, it gets so excited you get so excited about yeah. all of those something uh, you've created something you've created and you know especially when you're working with digital assets you're mm-hmm. seeing all these cool visual things and you get so excited like, and you I get down see it. you know you go down that <laughs> rabbit hole and then you know six hours later it's like oh well I should have spent maybe some of that time you know figuring out oh all right what are my expenses for this week mm-hmm. and yeah yep. yeah and I, and I think for any entrepreneur whether it's the quote unquote freelancer or creative lifestyle or it's like the traditional startup or lifestyle or lifestyle business, whatever mode of entrepreneurship it is, there is a, it's really easy to get caught up in the day to day and not take the time to step back and be like, okay, yeah. what, what is the, Big what's picture. the grand vision here and how do I, and what are the little things that need to happen that don't like, it happens to me all the time where I'm just like two weeks go by and I'm like, I haven't looked at like the overall strategy or I, I haven't you know, looked at my QuickBooks and done expenses in two months. Right. Like yeah. that kind of thing. You got to keep the drum beat. You got to keep consistency. Consistency and keeping a drum beat on it is what I've, you know, it's how I built the muscle of, you know, getting better at photography or what I'd like to think is getting better at photography. Um, but just always remembering in like reminders, setting reminders and all of that. It's like if you can get that and if you can do it in a week, it, it'll become habit. Mm-hmm. Well, so, so one thing I want to kind of wrap up with here before we wrap up the discussion is you've managed to build this, build out a team, right? You, you've managed to both get paid as a photographer and have a team of photographers who you can also pay, right? Somehow. Now, there are so many people in this field or who are artists or who whatever, right, who are struggling to just get paid themselves, especially in a field where there are a lot of people who will do it for free because they just want the experience or they can get coaxed into, yeah, it's my friend's brother, we're cool, right? Yeah, you can do this for free. How have you successfully managed to create a business out of this where, again, where it's not just you getting paid, but you're able to pay other people to do work as well? I'm still figuring out the answer to that question. <laughs> after I got flo- after I flo- got flown out to Dallas for the first time and got upgraded to a, like this was the cra- my first business trip. I got upgraded to a presidential suite. Ever since then, <laughs> I've been wondering w- why, why, how. Like I, I, I made I, it. <laughs> I made it. Like I, I, I don't get it. I, I'm not sure how it it happened. I think it. I'm very genuine and personable. I I like like I really like to be customer focused and I don't want to be pushing somebody out the door and all that. I want them to feel there's a connection in that because photography being in front of a camera, I'm not in it in front of a camera often and I'm very like for example right now, very vulnerable to do so. So you need it's like Yeah, you're usually behind the camera. Exactly. Yeah. So on that side like you need to make sure that your client and your customer is taking care of and comfortable making sure that you build a relationship. Like I'm doing business, but I'm also building relationships. It's and that's what's allowed the things to spider web like ever it's just like oh i've got i got somebody for this and that and so i've just kind of give the most personable approach to photography and you know if, if a bid doesn't go through then great on to the next opportunity and and all that it stinks to not get a job but they are still a, a it's a big enough ocean out there where there's just tons of opportunity 
and you just have to find what your niche is and and all of that. You know, you've got all these Instagram photographers with 20,000 followers and shooting the same cityscapes and the same <laughs> stuff. And I admire so many photographers who do that. Matt White's is one of my absolute favorite photographers who does that. But um, it, that's not photography. If you want to make it a business, you need to be personal. You need to be working with people, interacting. And, you know, you could produce content and it's just like city capes and all that. But it's not going to get you far because they, that isn't too over-commoditized industry where – if somebody wants a photo, they can find somebody who will do it for cheaper or mm-hmm. worse, free. <laughs> um, so I think it just, it was personable. Being being a very reliable, on time, I'm never late. Like, I'm never late. Like Except I hate, when you come to podcasts. Except when I come to podcasts. Like, this was really, no, seriously. For uh, one of the best, some of the best advice I ever got is if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, it's unacceptable. I live by that. If my photographers are not on time, I would... I, I I will flip out because the last thing that we want is to put stress on the event organizer, put stress on somebody. We need to be there ready to go and so that they are put at rest and making sure that they are taken care of. And, you know, I, I just think all of those little pieces, all of just the little, you know, adjusting the fork the right way, those are the things that make up and would have allowed me to excel and I think really have a very awesome career with photography. It took everything in me to not... Make, you said put them at rest to not say uh, in, peace, in peace. Undertaker wrestling reference. Okay, so Gong. so then before we wrap up, um, let our listeners know where they can find you online and how they can get in touch with you. You can find me on Instagram at Greg Rothstein. I think on Twitter too at Greg Rothstein. And if you want to follow my dog at Motley Rothstein on Instagram, but it's like M zero, right? No, 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 no. That's my gamer tag. My it's M one. It's M O T L E Y. But that's far. <laughs> um, if you are an organization that needs photography, or if you're an individual who needs headshots, you can check out my work at RothsteinPhoto.com. That's R O T H S T E I N Photo.com. I'm always looking to take on extra extra work and meet new people and new partners. Um, but yeah, otherwise you can find me at 1871 99% of the time. <laughs> to wrap up then, we'll go one by one and give our answer to today's question based on the discussion. We'll start with Victoria. Greg, we'll close with you. So Victoria, the topic today is when do you get your shit together? It's funny. And actually, let's, sorry, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off. Let's do it this way. Um, I want you to first say, what, what we'll do is, what do you need to get your shit together on currently? And then also just the overall, when when does someone need to get their shit together? Um, I feel like I feel like we've had a really similar discussion, like framed a little bit differently. Or I, because I feel like I've come to this like answer. <laughs> I feel like I've answered this a few times. Um, I need to get my shit together on my like my strategy. I feel like and sort of when I'm posting, how I'm posting, why, just like a little bit more big picture strategy, um, and. I think you need to get your shit together pretty early on. I just, I think, I, I, just, I think you set yourself up for success when you get it set up pretty early on. Um, each time I think that you get to something that you know is going to be iterated many times over, coming up with a process right away. Um, and it's weird. I'm like a super process person, but I, but it, it's, it's a really hard thing to do when you're just starting something out on your own, anyways, and when you don't really know where it's going to lead mm-hmm. or. Even sometimes at the beginning, you don't know what's going to iterate a million times over. Um, but yeah, I think as soon as you realize that something's going to happen many times, like I'm going to invoice a lot of times or I'm going to post this type of blog post many times, like maybe I should come up with a template or that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So I think as soon as you can, if you don't do it as soon as you can, as soon as it becomes really stressful. <laughs> mm-hmm. My answer, when do you get your shit together? So first off, for me, what I'm focused on getting together right now is just getting a better handle over cash flow. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny, like, you you hear, like, you watch, like, Shark Tank, and they'll be like, we need money because, like, cash flow. And you're like, how does that happen? Like, Wait, no, that does happen, right? Just because they sign a contract doesn't mean they pay it all on day one. Right. <laughs> so um, that's what I'm focused on right now as well as like developing a good like retention strategy mm-hmm. in the sense of like I do really good work up front but I never built into my model originally like what can how can someone continue to work with yeah. me so that's what I'm focused on now and then in terms of the when aspect of this um, for in general I think a person the, the point at which you get your shit together is the point at which you are Convinced this is not a hobby. This is yeah. a job. This is a lifestyle. This is a profession. Because 
if you continue to treat the profession as a hobby, then what happens? Oh, I can be late to this. Uh, it's fine. It's not real, right? Or you fall behind on invoicing, et cetera. Um, that, that's for me is the point is when you're like, no, this, is, this isn't a hobby. This is what I'm like slaving for essentially. Mm -hmm. Greg, when do you get your shit together? Hmm. When do you get your shit together? Sooner rather than later. Um, I, I, I truly think that that is the best, at least face value answer I can provide at this time is I, I really think that if this is, you have to, I think almost marrying the two is, you know, if, if you want to do this, if you want this better, harder than anyone else does, the earlier that you commit yourself to it and making sure everything's organized, the better it will be. And there's no big deal that, you know, I'm doing it at 26. There's nothing wrong with it, but I certainly wouldn't want to be at, you know, 20 years from now and still not have my shit together and all of that. So I do agree. When you just want to commit to it, you need to just genuinely, like, go balls to the wall with it and just genuinely, you know, say, all right, this is going to be, this is going to be it. Fire alarm. Yeah, I think there's a fire alarm. Is that this? Is that there's a building fire alarm in, the, in our building? And I'm almost positive that person who walked past the door what, do took, we need a, to go? took like a negative check mark of us because we didn't evacuate. So, oh no, I think it's just a drill. But, they they but laughed. I, no, they just made eye contact. But I, but I think they, they did. I think they did a negative check mark because we didn't, we didn't follow go. the fire drill. <laughs> There's a lot of firsts on this show. Whoa. First Instagram live, first live fire This drill. is awesome. <laughs> Do we take the show outside now? I don't know. Greg Rothstein, thank you for joining us <laughs> for the show today. <laughs> we may have to get out of a burning building right now. If oh. we're on air next week, you'll know that we made it out alive. Too sweet me. Too sweet. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> that wrapped up our conversation. Did you, the listener, enjoy this episode? If so, the best compliment you can give us is a rating and review on iTunes. Ratings and reviews help more people find the show, therefore more people get to discover their inner awesome. While you're leaving that review, go ahead and subscribe to the show on whatever platform it is you listen, whether that is iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or the various other podcasting platforms in which you can find the show. For full show notes, references, and resources from this episode, you can grab it all at discoveryourinnerawesome.com. Also check out our 100 plus episode archive while you're there. Whole lot of awesome for you to dig into. That'll do it for this one. Thank you again to our guests for joining. For Victoria Cohen, I am Raj Nation. You have been listening to the Discover Your Inner Awesome podcast. We will see you next time. But in the meantime, take care and be awesome today. <laughs> <laughs>